So here we are for another edition of The Truth About Your Health with my distinguished and honorable guest, Morley, Morley Robbins. And we are here to discuss, this is actually part four, I believe, yeah. or part five, might be part five. Part five, actually. Part five. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I know um, Ari Witten said part 17 or part 16, <laughs> but we're, we're on our way there. So um, I'm excited to have you in my office. Yeah, it's, it's a thrill. It's a, it's a pleasure. Yeah. So, so Morley, we, we, I took a lot of notes after our last interview. Okay. And we were talking about the recycling of iron. Yeah. And it's fascinating how the body needs only 25 milligrams of iron, of which 24 are what we already have in our body. Exactly. And, and when it doesn't, you have a neg negative regulator and a positive regulator. Right. Copper being the positive regulator and uh, iron being the negative regulator. Right. And we got into talking about how different environmental factors will make it difficult to uh, negatively regulate the, the energy production. And, and right. so can you, can you get into that a little bit? Because you lost me a little bit and I listened to it again and right. I wanted a little bit more clarification because it wasn't only vitamin D. There was also uh, high fructose corn syrup that you did on right. your own pod, on your own masterclass. Right. So maybe we could talk about um, what happens when the body isn't able to recycle iron effectively and how right. what the consequences of those are. Okay, sure. Uh, and, and it's a really, I think it's a really foundational concept to understand. And I appreciate you wanting to kind of dig a little deeper. Because uh, the whole notion of recycling is foreign to a lot of people. Like, our body recycles? Are you kidding? Right. And it seems, as I've gotten into the research, it seems that every recycling program requires copper. And so the, the, um, the cells have a stomach called the lysosome, and that's where the recycling takes place. And um, one of our good friends, uh, who's a um, radiologist, uh, Bryce has said that the lysosome runs on high energy peroxides, if you've got high energy peroxide, you better have copper nearby to help manage that and regulate that. And there, there are not a lot of articles that, that get into that, but one in particular that's very, very good at it is by Kim and Gonzalez uh, from 2021. And it's a very, uh, it's pretty highbrow, but it's, but I think even the average layman can follow it because it really gets into how sophisticated the lysosome is and how copper dependent it is as well. And like, why don't we know this, right? <laughs> but the, uh, the nuance is that every second of every day, every second, you gotta make two and a half million red blood cells. Well, the numbers get outrageously big when you start getting breaking it down to hemoglobin and then heme we're talking we're talking really big numbers every second right we've got to be able to make that and where is that where is that taking place it's in the bone marrow and the bone marrow is principally the pelvic region and the long bones that's where most of the bone marrow is and it's basically fat. But, but I think the, the important thing for folks to understand is that the, um, when we do a blood test to find out what's going on, especially for our iron, 70% of the iron in the body is in hemoglobin. That's a, I, I call it the bucket of iron. It's a huge uh, vessel of iron. That's the hemoglobin. Another 10% is supposed to be in the storage protein, ferritin. And that is supposed to be inside the cell. It's not supposed to be in the blood. When it's in the blood, it means it's outside the cell. That's not good. But um, I, we'll, I know we're going to come back to that. But then there's a third. Uh, and, and so the, the ferritin is like a teacup. 
So we got a bucket, we got a teacup, and then we have what's called serum iron, and that's a thimble. So we have 70%, 10%, one tenth of 1% of the iron is in the, the serum. The serum, and it's a really important one tenth of 1%, because it's telling us how efficient the recycling system is. And so there's a huge amount of iron in the blood. And when we do a blood test, only 1% of copper is in the blood. 46% is in the bone marrow. So if you really want to measure someone's true copper status, you got to do a bone marrow biopsy. That's funny. Yeah, you first. Right? Yeah. No, it's just, and no one ever thinks about that. Right. And, and if you really want to know what someone's iron status really is, either do a, a needle biopsy of the liver or do a Tesla 2 MRI. Right. They're very accurate, but not the Tesla 3, not the Tesla 4, 5, 6, 7. Tesla 2, for some reason, has the best affinity for measuring iron status. It's like, go figure, right? So the, the issue is the recycling system is critical for turning over the iron. And where is this, you know, so you've got, you've got the situation where iron's being stored in ferritin, but it's gotta be released. It's gotta get out. And it turns out that there's um, two different types of, of ferritin. You have what's called heavy chain and light chain. And it's actually a spectrum. And the way I characterize it now is, think of light chain as vanilla, and think of heavy chain as chocolate. Okay. Okay? Right. Anybody who knows anything about chocolate knows there's copper in, in chocolate. Right. right. Not so much in vanilla. But, but the thing is, the heavy chain means it has what's called the ferrooxidase enzyme function. And so heavy chain is like an ATM machine. You can put money in, you can take money out. Put money in, and, and what the fer ferritin heavy chain does is you can put iron in and you can take it out. And there's, there's no exhaust, there's no static, there's no, but on the light chain side, the, the action is stimulated by hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide will oxidize iron to get it into the uh, storage protein, but there's always a cost. It's gonna give off exhaust, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not a good thing. And in order to get it out of the ferritin, you know what you need? You need uric acid. Mm. <laughs> Right. And uric acid is, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, but uric acid is this like mind-blowing metabolite that's getting a lot of, of uh, notoriety now between Richard Johnson and David Perlmutter and a number of other authors. But it's like it's behind all of chronic disease because it's getting too high. But we need, we need it. It's, it's, it's a really essential part. It's all about the bell-shaped curve, the Goldilocks. Not too high, not too low, just right. And so um, the ferritin needs to be broken down, and it needs to be broken down in the lysosome. And it needs to have these high energy peroxides to do it. And if they can't crank it, what happens is <clears throat> the iron gets dumped into the tissue, and the there is a, a 10 amino acid cleavage of the ferritin protein and it gets released, it gets secreted into the bloodstream. So it shows up in the bloodstream and, and doctors have been trained to believe that what's in the, the ferritin in the blood is representative of ferritin in the cell. I wouldn't trust that marker. Right. And, and it's not just one author, I've, I've probably found seven authors who clearly say, uh, ferritin, Ferritin is not a good indicator of iron status. It's just, it, it's uh, too volatile as a, as a marker. But, but the thing is, the, the important thing is to understand is that there is a recycling program and that it, that it depends on energy and these peroxides to do that. And, and there's all sorts of 
chaperones and transport proteins involved in that. None of which I don't I don't think is taught in any kind of doctor school. All they teach in doctor school seems to be dipstick. Right. Too high, too low, whatever. But but it's a it's a much more uh, um, nuanced process to understand what's happening to iron in the body, and I think a lot of people um, don't realize the sophistication of their body, and they don't realize that the iron it's a critical nutrient. We know we can't live without it, right? But but iron is the foot soldier and copper is the general. So let's picture the Battle of the Bulge without Patton. It's a very different story when he's not there. It would, it, it would have been a very different ending of a war if he hadn't been there. But the thing is, the, every, as I'm coming to understand it, day by day, week by week, every facet of iron metabolism depends on copper. I mean, it's just the production of heme, the production of hemoglobin, the production of red blood cells, the recycling of the ferritin protein. It's, it's like, oh my gosh. It, it's so copper dependent. And this has been in the literature going back into the 30s. Actually, it started with the 20s, but a lot of literature in the 30s and 40s. But as recently as um, the 20 teens. I mean, there's some really sophisticated articles out there from 2016, 2018, 2019, 2021 with Kim and Gonzalez. And it's like, it's not, it, it's not hidden, it's just not being taught. Uh, you know, just to interject there, I've seen you in, be interviewed by different guests and you spill out research that they're not aware of. And I almost feel like in a paradoxical way, it's, it's not looked at as legit research if it's older research, right. but it should That's be right. the opposite. It should Absolutely. be thought of as the older it is when we didn't have all this technology or the incentives to publish certain things certain ways. That's right. That they were doing it with the limited technology. If anything, that research is much more sound and that much is, like you always say, is more enduring. And it is, is you find, I guess just as a side question, do you find when you present your research to people that interview you, they kind of shoo it off as, oh, that was done in the 20s or 30s. Or... I, they may not say it, but I right. think they're thinking it. Right. I absolutely believe that. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's not that they're not bad people. It's a societal meme that, right. well, it's got to be three seconds old to be valid. Right, right. And if it's, if it's are you kidding? It's 100 years old. Right. How can I possibly trust that? Right. Well, let's, let's talk about Newton. Was Newton wrong? Right. Yeah. Well, it goes. It goes to show. Like, I mean, it, by the time the ivory tower hits the street, it, it's already old news. Right. Right. And I, right. I think that you need that time for it to actually get implemented, versus the stuff that gets published today. You don't have the Morley Robbins giving it to you in your face right away. Here it is, right. and you're usually going to hear about that another twenty years from now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think what's what's important for people to appreciate is. There's, there's a level of simplicity, but there's a level of sophistication to how our body works. <clears throat> and that to me, the, the, the recycling system for iron, the formal name is reticuloendothelial system. I, I'd really like to know what that means. Yeah, why did they come up with that? Why did they come up with that? Right. But it basically means recycling. And it's, it's run by copper. It's totally run by copper. And What's important is um, the three principal uh, organs that are involved in it are the liver and the spleen and the bone marrow. So what's, what's happening in the liver? There's a lot of storage of iron in the liver. I'm not sure that's a good thing, but that's what's happening. The spleen is where the old red blood cells are being turned over. They, they, they go there, they get broken down, and the iron's gonna get, get released. It's also going to get released in the, in the liver because there's some breakdown in the liver as well. But, but the organ, I guess I call it an organ, I don't know what, what else to call it, but the, the substance in our body that has the strongest attraction for iron is the bone marrow. If, if, if iron had a choice between liver, spleen, bone marrow, they would always go to bone marrow. Is that because that's where the heavy concentration of copper is? Heavy or? concentration of copper, right. and it knows it's going to be turned back into 
heme, hemoglobin, and red blood cells. Right. You, you know what's amazing to me is is that you find with people that are searching for the root cause protocol and you see well you have to detox the liver or you have to get rid of mold or you have to get rid of epstein bar or you have to do this cleanse or that cleanse right. but no one's talking about what you just mentioned in terms of you what i love about it is you approach it from an energy standpoint yeah. and what more important is it than your body making red blood cells to be able to deliver oxygen, to be able to make ATP. And I, I think that's where the buck start, stops. Like, okay, maybe you have to, uh, iron that's trapped in your enterocytes and it's feeding parasites. Right. And at right. some point you're gonna have to address this. Right. But if you're gonna have a game of war and you wanna figure out which is the, the more superior a card, if you will, it, it's the necessity to be able to respire. It's the necessity to be able to, to breathe at the cellular level. Absolutely true. And there, there's a very famous um, physiologist. Um, he was actually a biologist, but I think he was drawn to physiology as a, as a profession. University of Wisconsin, back in the 20s and 30s. He, he ended up, it was so cool. His name was Conrad LVM. He was Dutch, originally from, from uh, the Netherlands, I suppose. But he started out as a farm boy outside of Wisconsin, um, outside of Madison, and he wanted to go to the university. And he enrolled and he got an undergrad in biology, then he got a master's, a doctorate, then he became in charge of the biochemistry department, then he became the president of the university. Oh, man. This guy is just, it's just a, kind of a rags to riches story that's fabulous. But he made this observation back in the 30s about he was, he was making this observation about copper seeking to transform iron into hemoglobin. And he was very specific about using that word, transform iron into hemoglobin, and that's what he does. And then I started thinking about it, building on that same idea. Copper transforms oxygen into water to release energy. It is the transformer. It right. is. It's taking these basic substrates, basic elements, transforming them so they become usable. They, they, they reinforce the need, the ability to produce and to be able to do whatever kind of work needs to be done. And that's copper's gift, is it's the transformer. Right. And it's, that's not, that's taken me 15 years to figure that out. Right, right, right. <laughs> now I see it very differently. I knew it was important, but it's like, there's like this holy grail quest about it. Right. It's fascinating. It's like Zen and the art of copper mastery, right? <laughs> you understand more and more. Yeah. Uh, you know what, so, so going back to the recycling and the negative regulator, and we did talk about how vitamin D is shown to, right. to keep the negative regulator from from operating effectively, exactly. if you will. Right. So maybe get into that, Morley, because <laughs> I, I'm kind of curious where you mentioned okay. the only way to continue recycling is through iron egress, and I didn't understand what that meant. So when the body has the negative regulator, there's no copper to positively re regulate the recycling of red blood cells, then hepcidin will, I look at it as the dungeon door that you know, that the right. comes down and the chains come down exactly. and, and clamps the door down. That's exactly what it right? is. Right, yeah. and, and, and then that way your body is now creating a whole bunch of exhaust, but it's also, um, I guess, fermenting glucose, not using oxygen aerobically. Right. We continue to make energy, but in order to continue the recycling, the iron egress, so I didn't understand that. Um, maybe you can also talk about that and then the other environmental factors that make the door not go down and why that's a problem given that the negative regulator needs to turn on given that you don't have the copper to positively regulate. So yeah. then maybe we can kind of go down that, that pathway now. Okay, so we're, we're in the football season, I guess we're- Yeah, in the playoffs almost. Coming yeah, playoffs. coming up to it. And so uh, forgive, forgive us, we're gonna use a football analogy. Um, and now everyone listening to this is, it has a nuance of football, but 
But everyone knows what a quarterback is. Quarterback makes the plays, quarterback gets the MVP trophies. Quarterback is the positive regulator on a football team. Very clear. They, they're the ones calling the plays, they're the ones making the plays. And I, I think it's a, a very easy analogy. The negative regulator on a football team is called the middle linebacker. Nobody wants to be <laughs> hit by the middle linebacker because he, he shuts down the play. Right. That's their job. They're, they're shutting it down. So what we're looking at here is the body is designed. If we're, if we're clipping along and making two and a half million red blood cells a second, the body has this obsessive need to be constantly rebuilding, turning iron into hemoglobin, which can then go in to feed the, uh, and the amount of hemoglobin in one red blood cell, it's, it's like a billion. It's like, it's ridiculous numbers, huge numbers. So the thing is, the, the, the body is relying on copper to keep this system going. And when copper starts to get depleted, contrary to what the literature will tell you, oh, but the, the prevalence of copper deficiency is very rare. No, I think it's pretty, pretty endemic to the, to the planet. But the thing is, when copper starts to get low, th this negative regulator in the system is called epsidin, and it's, it's an acute microbial peptide. Well, what, what, it's, what it's really designed to do is to shut down the recycling program for iron to keep it away from the pathogens. Keep the iron in the tissue that's working with the, the, the macrophages, the pac membrane, the gobble up the dying red blood cells. <clears throat> keep that iron in the macrophages so it can't get out into the bloodstream because the good bacteria are in our gut, the bad bacteria are in our blood. And as soon as iron gets to a, a level of uh, excess, the pathogens have a feeding frenzy. That's well, well documented. And the, the thing is, the, the body's designed to recycle, the body's designed to rely on the positive regulator, keep the, the wheels spinning, but when it perceives that it's not able to do that, it's going to invite the synthesis of the negative regulator, it's coming out of the, the liver, liver is the command central for making um, hepcidin. Hepcidin is keyed off by um, interleukin-6, in particular inflammation is what's really going to trigger it the most of all, and sugar will tr trigger it. Well, that means sugar must cause inflammation. Well, it does. According to Nature Wants You Fat, that's the survival switch. Yeah. But they failed to mention anything about the bioavailable copper and the positive regulation. Exactly. Right. And, and so the thing is, that the, the body has this mechanism of turning on the hepcidin to shut down the iron recycling to keep it away from the pathogens. And that's called our immune system. Right. You know, it's just it, it's a it's a primal response to what's perceived as a threat. Right. And which just to interject, yeah, yeah. it would be great because I again I told you this that I really enjoyed. I don't enjoy hearing you say, you know, when I kick the bucket, but I enjoyed when you say <laughs> when I kick the bucket that if I had made the change of doctors looking at anemia with not the knee jerk reaction of let's pump you with more iron, right. but it's a chronic illness. I think what happens is hopefully not just that happens, but the whole mentality of, wait, is the body doing something intelligent here? Exactly. Or right. is it something that we need to pharmaceutically override right. and shut down and, right. and, and support? It took, me, it took me years of working with clients who had what they said was anemia, low hemoglobin. Technically, hemoglobin, he, anemia only refers to low hemoglobin. It doesn't refer to low ferritin. It doesn't refer to low serum iron. It's been bastardized over the years, but technically it's referring to... By definition. By definition. Do we have enough red blood cells in the blood and therefore hemoglobin to support that? Right. That's true anemia. And and what, what uh, Joel is referring to here is this... The, the, the abject confusion about anemia of iron deficiency, 
there's not enough iron in the, in the body. It's showing low in the blood, but no one's thinking about what's iron status in the tissue. So the, the blood is anemic, but it's the tissue anemic. It's like looking out in the ocean. There's no boats. There's no boats in the ocean. Well, take your blind. Oh, there's a whole other ocean over here. There's a lot of boats over there. Absolutely yeah. true. Right. And, and so getting people to realize that iron presents differently in different tissue, that's, that's huge. But getting, getting practitioners to realize, wow, there's a, the way I described it in one of my presentations, there's a calculus to copper's role in regulating iron metabolism. But what doctors have been taught to use is just a ruler measuring iron. But you don't, you don't solve calculus with a ruler. And the ruler is off, by the way. Yeah. Like not yeah. only is it in measuring the absolute, it, the absolute numbers are way up here when you, right. you can be telling down here that if you're gonna use a ruler, at least use a ruler accurately. Exactly. You, you know? And, and the thing is that the, when hepcidin starts to flex its muscles, because the liver perceives there's inflammation. It's a cell danger. It's a, it's a cell danger response. Exactly. Right. And all the, all the immune system is doing is, we gotta batten down the hatches, we gotta stop the iron egress, so that iron is not gonna get into the bloodstream to feed the pathogens. Right. It's a very simple response. And you make the comment about, is the body doing something intelligent? But what I was gonna say a minute ago is, it took me a long time to figure out why do people have low hemoglobin? It's actually pretty simple. The body knows there isn't enough bioavailable copper to activate the oxygen. So why would I bring in more oxygen into a system that I know can't support it? So it's going to regulate down the production of hemoglobin so we're not gonna have as much oxygen so that if we have too much oxygen in the system and there's no copper to either activate it or deactivate it, we're well, gonna have oxidative stress coming out the yin yang. Right. And I think the body does have an intelligence to say, hey, stop, yeah. we don't need all this hemoglobin. No, no, put oil on the fire. Exactly. Well, that same thing happens with thyroid, Marley. I see yeah. that as well. Right. So that the right. body's intelligent. We don't need to continue fanning the fire, right? <laughs> so let's slow down the, the thyroid signaling, right. the thyroid uptake, the thyroid conversion. Let's exactly. produce antibodies. Let's go out of our way to do whatever we can to slow this oxygen sensing and, and metabolic activation of oxygen that's only going to get converted into hydroxyl radicals or right. it's going to right. going to oxidize and, and i think that's the problem very similar in the sense that well let's just give you thyroid hormone or let's just pour more iron in there exactly. and not look at what's actually going on yeah and that there is there isn't enough awareness that again the, the biggest bolus of iron in the body 70 percent is in hemoglobin Another 10% is in muscles called myoglobin. So that's 80% of the iron in the body is a waiter carrying oxygen. Right. Who's the chef that's slicing and dicing the oxygen? That's copper. And no one's thinking about that side of the equation. It's all about supply. Well, are we able to work with it? And, and there's, um, I've only seen it in one article. Um, it was an article about hypoxia. And when we hear the word hypoxia, we suddenly go, on top of Mount Everest. It's altitude, lack of oxygen, but that's not what hypoxia is referring to. At a cellular level, it's functional hypoxia. And it's not a lack of oxygen, it's inability to activate the oxygen. And if the oxygen can't be activated because copper is not present in the mitochondria, then it's gonna be turned into an oxidant. It's gonna be superoxide, it's going to be hydrogen peroxide. It's going to be hydroxyl radical. It might be peroxynitrate. Oh no! And it's going to it's going to devolve into one of those, and that means it's not available to become water because it's already been transformed into one of these other. And and that's and and the the design of our body is such that our maker and mother nature wants copper to both activate oxygen to make energy and deactivate the oxygens to clear the exhaust. I'm not sure I would have designed the system that way, but that's that's the job of copper is to work both sides. It's offense defense. Right. And and it's totally dependent on bioavailable copper to make that happen. 
Yeah. So, so then we, you did mention, so this is where I'm a bit confused. So if vitamin D has shown to not allow that negative regulator to slam the door shut. Right. So now that it continues to want to do the reticuloendothelial recycling through movement of iron, yet it doesn't have the, the, the key or the, the, the concierge to move it out of the tissues. So, so what, what kind of happens? I mean, obviously there's well, it's, more. It's more. actually, it, it isn't just vitamin D, it's ascorbic acid. Right. was another, um, and I'm, I'm trying to think there was. Tyrosinase inhibitors. And tyrosinase inhibitors. So right. There's a whole, there's a whole class of, right. of uh, elements. Um, what I need is my little cheat sheet. Which right, well the fructose, high corn syrup fructose, that, that tells it to shut the door? Or where, where is that fitting in? Um, what high fructose corn syrup is going to do, yeah, it's going to tell it to shut the door and then it's going to begin to produce um, more uric acid. And then uric acid is going to off, override the, the, um, the hepcidin and it's going to start to pull the iron out of the ferritin. I mean, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling. Right, right. I mean, it's just, it's like, you start to get into some of the uh, second and third order effects. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. And, and on top of that too, what which I think is fascinating is when there is so much vitamin D and vitamin A isn't able to be absorbed or help yeah. for the nuclear receptor, then that shuts down cellular respiration. Yep. Right. And then now we are being glucose burners yeah. and, and we're not able to aerobically burn fat right and really what i picture morley is a, a tailpipe that has massive amounts of smoke coming out of it yeah that's a good it's image. like a, a plane spinning under out of control spiraling down and eventually hitting hitting the floor yeah so that's that's all of that is kind of where we talked about yeah. the last time right right but now where do you feel it needs to go with obviously uric acid is a big one one thing i do this is a completely left field one um but i want to i want you to help answer this because i think a lot of really good people that um have not necessarily been taught all that needs to be taught uh, about about the subject so it has to do with um with copper two and copper one okay. and you and i had a conversation the other day a lot of People want the copper one so that it's in its usable, ready to go form, right. and are being told that copper two isn't able to be utilized and it just bioaccumulates, and you have high extracellular copper that's basically inert, not able to work. But the amazing thing about ceruloplasm is the fact that it has the ability to reduce copper right. two. Right. Um, some people feel that it doesn't do it very effectively or it doesn't do it at all, or it's not worth it to get the sources of copper to. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. I don't mean to put you on the spot, no, but no, I, I want to be able to talk about that because I want to bridge the gap between, I think you have a lot of like these sects that sort of divided from these religions. Right. And at the end of the day, instead of having war, they're so close with their principles and philosophies that you just need a couple little bridging conversations to say, hey, you say, you think the same thing I do, but I took a different slant on it. Now that I see your slant, which is in this case, the truth and chemistry and biology 101. Right. But maybe we can talk about it. Cause I personally don't understand it as much as I'd like to, but as soon as you told me ceruloplasm has the ability to do that, it would make perfect sense. Yeah. And it, and it isn't just ceruloplasm. There, there are several, what are called reductase enzymes and um, BCYTB, steep three, uh, I'm sure there are others. They all have this natural ability to reduce. Right. And so, and that we're talking about chemical reduce. So if something is plus two, it's going to become plus one. Or something is plus three, it's going to become plus two. Right. But the thing is, um, plus one, uh, cuprous copper, is found inside the cell. Plus two, cupric copper, is found outside the cell. Well, there's got to be a way to, to regulate that, and that's you know one of the one of the many jobs of, of ceruloplasm. There's a fascinating article by a famous uh, metal biologist. His name was Earl Frieden. Uh, he was sort of the dean of, of um, metal biology 
in the 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe even early 90s. Um, but he was at uh, Florida State University. He wrote a really important article in 1968 in uh, Scientific American, which would be designed for the public. You know, it's not, it's not nature, it's not science, right, right. Scientific American. And he's talking about the um, biochemistry of coffee. It's an amazing article. Again, it's from 68. But in it, he, he talks about three forms of copper. So we've got this copper two, plus two, got copper plus one, copper neutral, copper zero. I've never, I've never seen it written up. <clears throat> and, um, and it's, and it's a, another valence for copper. And what does that mean? It means it's immediately accessible to the body. The tissue. There's no resistance. What what the plus one plus two is? There's got to be a transaction to allow the, the copper to get in. And copper zero, there is no transaction. Right. And so, the, the form of copper that we use in the recuperate product, uh, it, it's copper bisglycinate. And the folks at Albion uh, figured out a way to make copper that copper neutral. That's what runs copper bisglycinate. It's, it's a copper neutral. So it, it really diffuses this whole thing plus one plus two. Right. But I think what, what's important is um, the, the challenge we face, I think where some of these uh, reductase enzymes are found is in our gut. And the, the uh, exposure to chemicals and, and, and different medications and what have you, I think have really compromised our reductase bacteria. Right, and that's where the I think that's where the the, uh, the challenge is. Right, to help restore this natural mechanism, and I, there's no question that that fer the ferrooxidase enzyme function is critical for it. Now, ferrooxidase is referring to oxidizing, but the ceruloplasmin protein has um, many and varied uh, uh, functionality, and so the the gut needs to have more bioavailable copper right. to do this. Right, and that and that, I always look at it as demand and supply. So if you think about that, that would be the, um, I guess that's the supply, right? In terms of you have the healthy flora to be able to reduce the copper one because it, it it's able to do that. So it's supplying more. Right. Whereas the demand with the farming practices and the leaching right. of our minerals and the glyphosates and right. the not ripening of our foods and just it's not able to to make the available copper and it's in its ready to go state so your demand is that much higher right. and I think that's the argument is is that in a lot of the crappier products or um, f food sources you're getting too much of the copper too, then our body has mainly been designed to have to reduce. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, but I would imagine the supply is is lower and the demand is higher. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I think, you know, um, uh, Charlie Barker, um, God rest his soul, but Charlie Barker was probably the most articulate about the proper copper. Right. But he was really referring to it from the standpoint of in the agricultural setting, you can spray copper two down on the soil, and the microbes know what to do to turn that into that copper one right. to get it into the plant. Right. But but in order, it's going to have to get back to copper two in order to get back into the body. I mean, it's just there's a constant right. flip flop that's taking place, and so I I think that there's an undue emphasis placed on valence when in fact what we need to be focusing on is how do we support the bodies of natural ability to make bioavailable copper to make the well, that, that, that's the, that's the thing and I think it, it's important to mention that um, when you told me the other day that um, you had talked to Charlie and he did mention to you that the ceruloplasm he was didn't understand I think the nuance right. of the bioavailable copper and and mentioned to you that he was wrong about that. Not to you know dis, disparage no, anyone or no. He, he, you know he, his initial response was ceruloplasm has nothing to do with copper status. And I said, well, I think it's more complicated, or it's more foundational. And over a two-year period, or after a two-year period, he came to 
both call me personally, but also publicly say, right. he's right about cerebral palsy. Right. So he really, I give him a lot of credit for taking the time and the energy to study it and be able to say, hey, I was wrong. There, there is more to the story. And so it's just, I think it's important for people within the nutritional and medical arts community to understand that there is a subtlety to this that is not being openly uh, taught at the level that I think it needs to be taught. Right, which is a good segue to, to what we talked about in terms of what do we do about this, sure. right? I mean, and, and I really love the concept. We talked about the Pentium chip and how the RCP is really the overriding stop doing these things that deplete your bioavailable copper, start right. doing these things. Um, but then we talked about we have really great minds and practitioners that have really followed that to a T. Right. But yet, because of the perfect storm of life and the environment and, right. I guess, if you will, post-traumatic stressors in their life and other nuances, that they're not getting those next level of improvements. Exactly. Uh, and th th right. th yeah, there are, there are always going to be some roadblocks in the way. Right. And to me, the biggest roadblock is more of an emotional nature, unwillingness to let go of the fears or the anxieties or whatever the, the um, emotional issues might be. But there are others, and we can get into that. But I think people need to realize that the, the body does respond to energy, but when there's emotional unrest, it's going to deplete the energy in the system. Right. It's going to have a big impact. Yeah. And I think a lot of people miss that. Oh, too right totally. and, and and we've talked about this too where I think it's really important to when you're a practitioner and you work with a patient so many of them are like this Marley like okay like I've been here I've been there I've been here I've been there I don't yeah. want to be there and you ask them well where do you want to go well I don't want to be there anymore I don't want right. to go there anymore and it's like well what about over here like exactly. where do you want to go Absolutely. so I think that is a really important part of the emotion component Right. Because if you don't know what the destination looks like, how Absolutely. do you know if you're getting closer to it? I totally agree. It's it's huge. And people keep playing these tapes from the past. Right. And don't have a sense of what, what are they really trying to push right. towards? Right. What is their dream? What is their, their passion? What are they striving for? And they, they keep throwing the anchor back here. Right. And it just, they, they get stuck. They do. They absolutely get stuck. So, so then as far as the other things that we talked about, um, you talked a little bit about, and this is, we're kind of all over the place, and I have, I have notes here that I'm looking yeah, at, um, and I think these are good um, talks in terms of autophagy and what autophagy is and autophagy of ferritin. That was a word that I hadn't heard be combined together. Right. Uh, and how copper is necessary for that. So I'm interested to know, and you've given me research articles that I need to get into that I want to, but what have you seen in your research of autophagy, autophagy of, of ferritin, um, how copper plays a pivotal role in that? Sort of a, a shift in what we're talking about, but I would love to get into that too, because I feel like you, you mentioned, and I, I tell people that one of the major activators of your immune system um, and the NADPH oxidase enzyme and histamine is the fact that iron is going to oxidize. And when iron oxidizes like that, that's a major growth factor. mTOR is stimulated. And Absolutely. you've mentioned that many times, and I'm glad you have, in terms of people need to realize we're in a constant growth cycle. And they yeah. do mention that in the book, right? 365, we have access to fruits, we have access to light 24 seven, we're eating all the time. So it's necessary and vital for those non-responders to implement into their strategy, the ability to plow the fields instead of always growing the seeds and recycle the soils and re remove misfolded. And I think people are understanding that now. They understand the term autophagy, right. but they only mm -hmm. use the I need to intermittent fast or I need to restrict my proteins. But we're back at the Pentium here in terms of right. copper and, and how this all regulates it. So maybe explain well, that. I'd love to hear, hear about that. Well, the thing is, uh, I have a very simple rule. Uh, any condition that's not working right, it begins with the letter A, needs vitamin A. Autophagy, 
Mm. Well, it's obviously it's not working right in a lot of people. Right. So how do you make copper bioavailable? You've got to have retinol, right? And so you get into autophagy and you suddenly find out that, again, we're back to these high energy peroxides and they've got, they've got to have energy and they've got to do what they, they do. And it's like, oh my gosh, we're back to bioavailable copper again. And it's so subtle in, in its um, presence, but it's critical for the activity to take place. And again, there's, there's a constant recycling in our body. And the, uh, the literature is very clear about what happens when retinol comes in on the scene, it, it begins to ignite. I think there's an energy to it in and of itself, but it's, it's enabling the transactions that need to take place to support the ongoing process of rebuilding the body. And to, to me, it's, it's, I'm fascinated that they gave a Nobel Prize for autophagy, I don't remember them talking about vitamin or, A, vitamin A or yeah. copper. Yeah, I've seen some pretty big influencers that I've seen at metabolic summits. The all the names we know, and I ask them about vitamin A, and they're deer in the, deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting yeah. as we're talking. It would make sense that if we have to recycle two point five million red blood cells per second, right. not to even get into the orders of magnitude of heme and hemoglobin, right. but if we have to do that. And that's called our reticular endothelial system, and that's our recycling. Absolutely. It would make sense if that's not happening, then our recycling of misfolded proteins isn't happening. Our, our entire recycling is not happening. I was reading a fascinating article this morning about um, movement disorders, you know, Parkinson's and all the related disorders. Right. And there's, a, there's a dozen of them or so, tied to hematology. And the inability to replace the red blood cells properly, it, it's, a, it's an early warning sign that there's a problem. And it, they, again, they don't go into the level of detail about bioavailable copper that I want, but the fact of the matter is they were able to connect hematology to movement disorders, which means that the blood's not being replaced properly, the recycling system's not working properly, it's creating exhaust in the system and it's playing out in the signaling for neurotransmitters and other other nuances of, of movement in the body. And you know, and it's it's interesting because it shouldn't be so head scratching or confusing if even you're a lay person and wondering why we're talking about copper and why it's all copper centric. I mean, think about the plug and the wire plug and the copper right. wire that makes it work. Think about I love this when you said, you know, iron is more structural, copper is more catalytic. In the buildings, the copper keeps the the f current flowing and the and the pipes moving, whereas exactly. the right. iron keeps the structure structure up. Right. Um, just a segue. I, I told you about a, a young lady who emailed me, and she's oh, yeah. you know she's in a in more of a, a difficult I guess a, a European country where the it's difficult to get testing and it's even harder to get good good providers that understand this but it's deflating morally when you present this message of how important copper is <laughs> and then you you give them advice right. and then they tell you well i'm concerned and it's not their fault it's what they're being taught and told by their providers this thing of copper toxicity it's copper toxic. toxicity so i guess for our viewers is there a 60 second elevator pitch to explain right. hey it's not it's not yeah. toxic it, you, you just it, you're being told the exact opposite i mean what yeah, yeah then uh, I, is there why don't you catch the door real quick yeah and then, uh, I'll, I'll deal with the um, right. uh, the copper toxicity issue because it's a it's an important one um the the copper the ratio of copper to iron is very, very important to understand in the body. So, so for every atom of copper, there's at least 50 atoms of iron. Um, and people don't appreciate that. They don't understand that, that the copper atom is completely outnumbered in the same way that generals are outnumbered by foot soldiers. Again, we're back to the same concept of, oh, well, there's someone who has intelligence telling the other guys that don't know what to do. Well, to me, iron is a, it's a dumbwaiter. If 80% of iron is carrying oxygen, it's a dumbwaiter. 
It, it does what it's told to do. And it's been glorified into this. Dumbwaiters are the things in the buildings, all right? Right, yeah. Right. right. So it's more it's a dumbwaiter. Yeah, exactly. Not against the guy. Exactly. <laughs> right. but, the, but the thing is, that what science is trying to do is turn iron into a sentient being. It is not sentient. It is not thoughtful. I could go on for a couple hours about what right. copper does, but right. iron is basically taking orders and following what, what it's supposed to do. Right. But the thing is, uh, if you don't appreciate that, if you don't understand the both the order of magnitude, there's way more iron in the body than there is copper. Then what they're trying to say, let's let's pretend that copper is a navy seal, and iron are ninja warriors, and and we know that iron interacts with oxygen, and copper will too. They both will interact with oxygen, but the design from Mother Nature is for copper to make the oxygen usable and to clear the exhaust. Iron either carries it or creates static, creates creates a lot of exhaust. And so we've got this order of magnitude, at least 50 to one more iron than, than copper. And we have this, this copper finds its way into enzymes that work with the oxygen. Iron is not finding its way into enzymes to carry it, it literally just carries it, that's right. its job. And so the other side of it is the whole notion of copper toxicity was the brainchild of Carl Pfeiffer, famous MD, PhD. Uh, back in the 60s, he wrote a very important book called Mental and Elemental Nutrients, um, written, I think it was in like 68, something like that. And he wrote articles about the different elements, but he was really fascinated by copper. And in a particularly poignant article, he talked about copper becoming unbound from cerulean plasma under conditions of stress, which we've talked about. Right. Well, that that phrase, copper becoming unbound from cerulean plasma, became unbound copper, became free copper, became copper toxicity. And it was all the nuancing of the original scientific finding that then, like like in a game of telephone, you know, when you're in a yeah. big circle, yeah. the, the original message got changed, and by the time it got changed, it, it went from being copper unbound from its protein, ceruloplasm, to it's toxic. And it's like, the copper is always bound. If it's not bound to ceruloplasm, which is where I've seen it as high as 98% of the copper in the blood uh, it is bound to ceruloplasma. You have to keep one thing in mind. Only 1% of the copper is in the blood. Right. 99% is in the tissue, folks. Right. And it, when it's in the tissue, it's working with enzymes. When it's inside the cell, it's bound to a ligand. Can you believe they don't know what that ligand is? They don't know what the partner is to copper? Is it that they don't know or they don't want us to know? I don't know. But the point is, the vast majority of copper is in our tissue. Only 1% is in the blood. But when it's not bound to ceruloplasma, it's bound to albumin. It's bound to the amino acid histidine. It's bound to a transport protein called transcuprine. And my one of my favorite copper researchers is at Hopkins. Her name is Svetlana Lutsenko. She's brilliant, absolutely brilliant about copper. The article that she wrote back in 2019 was the heart, the, the mind, body, and soul of copper. That was a really cool article. But the thing is, she studied the amount of free copper inside the cell, and it was um, one to the negative, ten to the negative twenty-one. It's called zeptomolar. There's twenty-one zeros. And then a one, it's virtually impossible to have copper unbound right. in the tissue. Right. It's just, it's so... So where was Pfeiffer rapid. getting his, his information from? Well, he, again, he was, he was looking at it in the blood, and he made this, cop, this comment about copper, and through this game of telephone, his original finding got turned into free copper, Unbound, that free copper means it's toxic. And there's a lot of research that's been done over the years 
to try to blame copper for the lipid peroxidations taking place. Copper's causing LDL to be a problem child. And, and again, it's just, let's talk about the iron that's 50 times higher. Right. But they don't put the spotlight It's, it's in. always amazing to me when those broken telephones actually are the enduring things. Exactly. How that happens. Right. Just as a, as a side note, I was watching uh, the interview with Dr. Mercola. Yeah. And I wanted to talk numbers. So let's talk about the iron sinkhole we have in our bodies, right? Because that's what we have, right? right. And, you, yeah. and, and you conservatively said, times your age by 365. Take your yeah. age, yeah. Times it by 365. And that, in a very, very conservative way, will be the amount of iron that you've accumulated over your lifetime. Right. And so and that, and it's not my. That's, that's, that's not, not you, that's not Morley Robbins. No, that's that's, that's, that's iron biologist. That's, right. That's Robert Crichton. That's Douglas right. Kill. That's right. Gunnar's well, Hellman. I think it goes without saying. Whenever you, I mean, you have opinions, but yeah. your opinions are based on research, right? right. So exactly. So talk the numbers because I think it's really important for people to realize because I see this with my patient base where when you start to turn on the engine. Right. by making more bioavailable copper. Uh, it, it's kind of like a rebuilt engine in the sense that you have a lot of black smoke to clear out once you get that yeah. engine working right. right. And that's where you have to be very slow and methodical because it's not necessarily more is better. You, you don't want to, what I call, metabolically overwhelm the system and go into shutdown mode. Right. But with that being said, you there is an impetus as a major tool besides the things that we recommend to stop doing and the things that we start to we recommend to start doing in terms of the numbers maybe get into that more like how much iron typically is released in a donation how much uh, mm -hmm. iron should we have how much do we typically have right. um, so that we can get an idea that this is a verb this is something that's going to be ongoing Right. right. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I just just celebrated my my seventieth birthday back in November. So you take your age times three sixty five. Well, this is this is the amount of iron. It's twenty five thousand. That's conservatively, right? I mean, yeah. obviously, maybe yeah. like twenty years ago, probably would have been a lot higher with the dietary Cons enriched foods you would might have been eating and so forth. So. A man is supposed to have about 5,000 milligrams. I've got five times more iron. Right. Now, technically, I may not have that much, but theoretically. Right. But the thing is, people aren't talking about this formula. People are not aware of the fact that every day we're on the planet, we're accumulating one milligram, at least one milligram. That's before we... Not dietarily. Exactly. Right. And we're not even taking not into account the supplements, supplements the foods, enriched the foods. foods. Exactly. Right. So the, the thing is, it could even be higher, right? Right. So the, the and where where is that iron going? It's going in the liver and the spleen. <laughs> it's, it's just, especially when there isn't adequate copper in the diet. If, if copper is low, iron is going to accumulate in the body. Where is it going to accumulate first and foremost? It's always going to go to the spleen. It's, it's has this um, gravitation always to, to the liver. I'm, I'm not exactly sure why, but it's important for people to know that. And that was first established in 1928. Again, the, the work at University of Wisconsin, where Dr. Eldian was part of the team that, that came up with that. And then uh, other, you know, Dr. McHarg, a year later, confirmed their findings. So it's not like, oh, it was a bunch of wackos it was right, right, right. It's, 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 it's established notable people notable people and it's been replicated regularly right going forward but the thing is people don't know this right they don't know that low copper in the diet is going to accumulate iron in the tissue that's an important thing to know that as we age there is this cumulative accumulative effect of uh, copper or excuse me iron building in our tissue and what's going to happen there's going to be more oxidative stress as the iron builds, and the more rusting, more rusting, more rusting. The, the the mitochondria are going to start to choke on all this iron, right? Because they don't know what to do with it all, right? And the reason why we talk about doing the blood donations is to begin to offload that iron 
So when you do a standard blood donation, you're going to use, you're going to fill a bag that can hold 500 milliliters of fluid. And based on saturation, right? Based on saturation, route numbers, about half of that is going to be iron. So you're going to get rid of 250 milligrams of iron. Why? I gotta do a lot of donating. Right. To, to get I wonder in your math formula though, if you are, I mean, all things created equal, which we have negative regulators and lack of positive right. regulators, but could you do 24 times 365 given that you need 24 units of iron to recycle the 24 hour supply of red blood cells? Is that is that a fair equation or not I've, necessarily? I've thought about that. It, yeah. I don't know what to do with that right. equation. Right. So what we're basically saying is 24 milligrams is need 25 milligrams of iron is needed to to yeah. do the heavy lifting of recycling all the 2.5 million red blood cells per second times 60 times 60 times 24. Right. You only need 24 milligrams of iron to do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is amazing in and of itself. See, the thing is, when according to the, the great clinicians and scientists back in the 20s, you know, what did they know, right? But, right. but back in the day, and they were measuring the amount of iron that the mom donates to the baby and the amount of copper that the mom donates to the baby. So assuming that, that uh, Joel and I are healthy, we have livers that have about seven milligrams of copper. And when we were born, it was 70 milligrams of copper in our liver. Our Iron feet. or? Of copper. Of copper. copper. Right. And that's that's a huge bolus of copper. Right. And, and now if we're healthy, we have about 100 milligrams of copper. So let's talk about the iron side. Right. Iron, the donation of iron from mom is supposed to be about 450 milligrams of iron. Four, right. So 450 versus 70. Right. So it's, it's about six times more iron. But, but now I'm, I'm, you know, got 25,000 milligrams and 100 milligrams of copper if I'm lucky. The, the ratio is way out of whack. Right. Right. And so no one's thinking about this. Right. No one's thinking about this constant process of adding iron through the food system, through the through the uh, supplements that we're taking and, and all the other variations. And where's the where's the copper supplementation? Where's the copper fortification? Yeah. It's just, it doesn't even exist, except in, in some of the supplements that you can buy. And no one's aware of the order of magnitude of distortion that we started out with 450 iron, 70 copper. Six to one. Six to one. Do you think that's the maybe that's the ideal ratio that we, if you speculate that's what we're endowed with that's what it optimally would be throughout our life cycle well wouldn't that be fast so that would be yeah. 600 milligrams of, of iron right now, right the hematologist would collapse at that right yeah they definitely would be eating uh, what, right. what, what joel is getting to is something that i've been thinking about in the last probably year year and a half is given the the power and the importance of the of the recycling system. What's really important here is that I think the numbers, as you're as you're coming to to piece this together the way I have, I think the numbers for iron could be dramatically less. And when you get into the, the research that was done in the in the 30s, especially, the, the amount of copper that was in our blood was much higher. Where we, we consider a hundred is, is healthy now. They were, they were seeing people with 150, 180, much, much, much higher. That wasn't because of inflammation. It was just higher levels in the blood. Right. So it's just, right. the, the numbers have gotten distorted over the last That's century. in serum iron. Exactly. Serum iron, which yeah. is 1%. Right. Right? Yep. Right. Interesting. So I'm all over the place here with my questions because no. it's kind of coming to me. No, so, so, so one of the things on the, on the start list is magnesium. Yep. And I had a Q and A with my with my group that I work with today, and they asked me the question about transdermal magnesium. I said, "Well, you know, what? I actually know Morley. I'm going to talk to him and ask him." Yep. So between ingested malate or glycinate or a topical magnesium, it, 
one of the you know, which, magnesium water or magnesium water or salts right yeah. flakes yeah. is there the question I had from one of my my patients was is it feasible to get through foods and through just the topical without having to do the ingestion of the of the malate and the glycinate have you seen that uh, historically or anecdotally um, intriguing um, I don't know that I've seen it a lot I think what what I encourage people to do is get as many varied forms of magnesium as they can. Right. So we've got magnesium water, magnesium bicarbonate would probably be the easiest. If you're really, if you're not willing to make it for yourself. Those are the the hydrogen waters. Is that what that is? Have you no. seen those? Well, I have seen those. I, I thought they were with magnesium in there, or no? I don't. I thought that was one of the active ingredients. I don't know about that. I'll check that out. But go to a a Polish supermarket. And they sell Polish water. There's, Poland has the highest concentration of magnesium on the planet. God knows why, but but it's the, the magnesium in, in Polish water is amazing. So magnesium water, um, transdermal. If you can go to the ocean, or if you can get some Epsom salts or, or transdermal, it's a great way. And and the absorption through the skin is very powerful. Then uh, third form is the um, Dietary, again, anything that's green are supposed to have magnesium. Right. Does it? I don't know. Right. I mean, there, there's some really interesting things that are taking place. So I was crushed when I was talking to a, a, a supermarket executive years ago, talking about how the, the broccoli looked so green. He said, do you know how they make it green like that? And I braced myself for impact. They use nitric oxide. Hmm. They force... The color, I don't know, I didn't have the presence of mind. I was kind of in free fall. But it's like, oh my gosh, they're engineering the color, not through magnesium, but through other vehicles. So it's just, it raises all sorts of questions as how much magnesium is really in the in the produce we're eating. Right. Because if it's not in the soil, it's not going to get in the plant, right? Right. So again, wherever possible, find organic food raised by responsible uh, farmers, right, and then we're then we're down to um, supplements, and I and I think we live in a world now where there's so much stress, both acute and chronic. I don't think we can afford not to supplement, right, with with the um, the mineral that's the chill pill, right. However, there you you do put in your protocol, and I want a little more clarification from from you, that some people will need to have the the cocktail loaded first so maybe describe yeah. that if okay. people have right. been taking yes. magnesium and they heat hit an upper li limit it, bowel intolerance is frequent but more importantly it just doesn't seem to be the chill pill right what, what's Good going point. on what's going on there no what, what happens is that the adrenal glands which are sitting on top of our kidneys so adrenal means ad renal on top of the kidney the adrenal glands are very sensitive to minerals, especially sodium and magnesium. And it's the ratio of sodium and magnesium that dictates how, how healthy they are. And you start pumping in a lot of magnesium to someone who's been under a lot of stress. Well, what you're going to do is, if, if sodium is here and you start increasing magnesium, you're going to tank their adrenals and their energy is going to plummet. Right. Right? And so what we encourage people to do who've been stress cadets uh, or live, live that lifestyle, they want to take the adrenal cocktail, which has the sodium, has the potassium, has the vitamin C to support and nourish the adrenal glands so that when you then begin to introduce magnesium, you're not going to overwhelm right. and, and invert the right. ratio. Yeah, I mean, there, there's an art to it. I mean, I love the idea of following the stops. Yeah, it makes sense. Like, just stop these things. Right. And some of them were hard for me because I was a practitioner that recommended some of these things. Sure. I recommended yeah. molybdenum a lot of the times for for sulfites that okay. have that suox enzyme that isn't working effectively, and and molybdenum is the cofactor. So you can help to, again, I know where you're going with, with this. If, if bioavailable copper is working effectively, everything's energetically based. Right. That's what I love about the concept of the RCP. 
because you're not down 10 streams down the road right. worrying about stopping molybdenum because it was such a good tool in my toolkit to clear out the sulfites. Now I'm not creating as much blockage of that enzyme that typically anything that's inflammatory is going to inhibit enzymes. Right. Right, so now I don't have to worry about speeding it up because I'm speeding it up naturally by removing the thing that's slowing it down. Exactly. Right. right? So a lot of the, the pins will get knocked down, like you said, with, with these are the responders. These are the people that do fantastic, and you see them all the time. Yeah. And you right. hear about them all the time. Right. Right? So, but then there's the, the non-responders where there's just the stress cadets, like you've said, and they have to nuance it where don't just follow it where you take all these things in phase one and magnesium's in phase one right. and you're not doing well. You, you got to go methodically through these and be able to understand why and what. And I guess what's the art of what you're seeing in that, Morley? No, I, th I think it's a, an important point. But to me, the most important variable in this process with the RCP is does the individual believe in their body's natural ability to heal itself. If they have doubt, and a lot of people have been chronically ill for years. Right. So they do have doubt. Right. They've been they've been in a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, a lot of disorientation, and, and they have conditioned themselves that my body is broken. Right. There's a level of fear there. And they've been to many practitioners. My 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 course record with a client was ninety nine doctors. 99. 99 doctors. Right. And when she started the RCP, it, everything fell into place. That's, that was a one in, one in a lifetime shock. Was there a big fear it component? Was, that it, was, it was an iron issue. Right. She had been told she was anemic. Right. So it, so once you, you get the, the, the right nutrients in the body, knows what to do. Right. But the thing is, um, very often when I'm working with people and they're doing the protocol, Following, following to the T's, and they plateau, there are only two questions I ask them. Because what, what we've learned about the RCP is, it does work. What does the RCP really do? It isn't just making energy, it's mobilizing iron. Right. It will, I guarantee you, you start introducing bioavailable copper into the body, the body will respond accordingly and it will release iron. And so the, the two questions I ask, have you, Donated blood, and have you dumped your fears? Right, that's good. Dump your blood and fears at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and it's not to, to um, in any way, dismiss the fact that there are non-responders. There are people who have uh, genetic morphisms, all these other things that, right. that we have to be sensitive to. But, but for the most part, people seem to be responding. And once they've cleared that, iron overload and they've dealt with the emotional issues the body begins to respond accordingly right and can begin to make the adaptations that need to right take place. right i guess one of the things we we talked about is a a good colleague friend that you have that follows it to the t and we talked about how when iron gets stuck in your enterocytes then you have your four challenges of getting iron out and histamine, emotions, and, and parasites, right? right? Um, but not just parasites. I would imagine that iron is, is food for, 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 all for, for all pathogens, right? right? But the parasites tend to hide better. Right, and, and they're, they're generational, right? They, and, and, but, but with that being said, one of the clinical tools I was mentioning to you is I've done many times where I'll do an organic acid test, which is a urine test right. that's looking at systemic microbes right right and it's being cleared through the kidneys so when we talk about mucosal lining we're not just talking about a stool test that would be looking at the lower colon exactly. we're looking at mucous membranes in the sinuses in the bronchial in the respiratory in the genital urinal in the kidney and, and female reproductive and the liver there's a lot of sinus tissue in the liver right right so so one of the things that I would say, and I suggest it to you as a, as a clinical pearl, this is just, I think, just showing off a little bit, but right. yeah, I think one of the things about that, what we've suggested is doing um, the nebulizers. Yes. And, and you could nebulize with disinfectants. There's a really gentle HCL blend 
or even a, a glutathione blend or anything that even saline I would imagine would be antimicrobial yeah. and that can really attack some of the non-responders that aren't getting you're not, you're not evicting the unwanted poachers from <laughs> from your body completely by doing GI GI programs right I, I, yeah. I, again I've, I've talked to some of my clients and I'm sure you've experienced it as well <clears throat> I'll bring up the, the term parasite it's, well I had I had a test and right I, 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 I'm it's clear. negative and I said yeah but that was a stool test right and, and who's who's doing a systemic right that's that's the challenge is getting people to realize that Parasites could be anywhere. It, it comes down to the same argument again with looking in the ocean, right? And right. you know, one of the studies that nailed it for me was I, I can't, I don't have the photographic memory that you do, but it was a study on autistic children, yep. and they did hair samples, and the ones that had more heavy metals in their hair were they from the autistic cohort or were they from the non-autistic? They were from the non-autistic. And the reason that is, is because they're getting the heavy metals out. They're expressing So right. if exactly. you take that mentality of, well, I did a hair sample and there was no metals in there, yeah. then just because it's not coming out doesn't mean it's not in there. Absolutely. Right? And yeah. I think that's a major mistake a lot of people unfortunately make. Yeah. People don't know how to properly interpret the hair test. Right. And if it's low, they think it's safe. Right. And that's not always the case. Right. Especially with the heavy metals. Right. But the, but the important thing is for people to realize is that the, the minerals can be tested. You can use the hair test. You can use a blood test. I've never done minerals and, and urine, but I know there are practitioners who do that extensively. But we're looking at a completely different way to interpret it because it's, it's minerals coming out. Well, are they coming out at the right rate? And, and that's, where, that's the nuance is understanding what, under what conditions is it coming out. Yeah, I, I think there's there's an evolution of the practitioner too in terms of they test what they know right right like I'll, I'll looking back 10 years ago i did a lot of food sensitivity testing and micronutrient testing and i would just reduction it sickly say okay you're sensitive to this food let's remove it you have these micronutrient deficiencies let's improve it right however once you start to let's just say put the pentium chip in the in the computer and generate energy, then you're not making massive amounts of histamine that's taking a flamethrower to the GI tract that's causing the effect of food sensitivities. Exactly. So you're, right. you're actually getting to, quote unquote, the root cause. Yeah. You're, right? You're allowing the body to naturally energize itself and, and be able to bring itself back into balance. So, so what's next for, for Morley? What's next for, I know I'm, I'm privileged because potentially I'll be seeing a lot more of you yeah. being in the area. Yeah. Um, I know you went on this, what did you call it? You called it a, not a strabatical. 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 Strategic sabbatical? Strategic sabbatical. Okay. Um, and I'm getting more emails now than I had in the past because <laughs> I think you're back on the, the research of, of articles. But is there any di I mean, uh, directions that you want to go or what's left still on the to-do list? No, it's a, it's a great question. I think the, the big macro quest is what can we do to de-iron the body faster? And what can, what can we do to recopper, recuperate the body? And I think it's so important for people to realize that there are mechanisms but there's no operating manual. There's no, you know, there's, there's no book that we can go to and says, well, this is how you do it. Right. We're, we're making this up as we go along. And uh, Dr. Liz and I are obviously in the, in the Florida area. We're, me, we've probably met in seven or eight practitioners since we've been here. It's just a, this is a hotbed of switched on folks. Many, of, most of whom, almost all of them, are um, aware of or are becoming aware of this guy is probably one of the most proficient in terms of his, not just his understanding, but his application of his understanding. I'm very grateful for your, Thank you. for your efforts. Yeah. But the thing is, more and more people are, more and more practitioners are coming to realize that this is a piece of the puzzle that they've not known about. Right. And it just presents a foundational um, component. I think that the, the real dream, you're saying what's next, 
it's how do we how do we de-iron, how do we recopper? But uh, Joel made a reference to the, the, the Pentium chip. We, we would love to see RCP become this Pentium chip in practitioners' practice. Right. That it becomes um, just a natural part of working with the clients, with the patients, that they understand what to avoid, they understand what to do, <clears throat> and then begin to address the problems that are beyond the RCP, get to that non-responding right. component, right? so that they can begin to clear the, the, the foundation of the, of the problem, that the body can naturally take care of itself. Right. Right. And really begin to move into the more challenging issues. And I would say too, you'll probably get started with more of the alternative practitioners first. Oh yes. But I think yes. once you get into the the best one would be the OBGs and the fertility doctors, especially with the research that you're sending me with. Can you believe how much retinol and copper is going on in the placenta and how genes are orchestrated to be able to infuse that because it's such a metabolically necessary active right. tissue i mean that's our our model for if that's what that demands then every single cell organ tissue and system in the body demands that as well and changing and pushing over the sacred cows of those highly guarded professions of vitamin a is toxic <laughs> copper toxicity <laughs> you know it, it's well, it, it's amazing that with that advice, there isn't more challenges than there are. I know. Well, one, one of our one of our dear friends is uh, Martha Carlin. She's a uh, she calls herself a citizen scientist. Right. And um, she's been through the program. You know, she's graduated the RCPC Institute, and um, she she came came across some amazing research, especially today. But this one that she found that I don't think I sent it to you yet. Um, it implies that copper is what, it has the ability to create a double helix just by its very presence. Well, it's like, wait a minute, does that mean the copper needs to be there to make DNA? It, it was implying that the copper was almost instrumental in creating the energy that allows the DNA to twirl. Mm. It's like... Well, that's how you describe too with the rotary yeah, as well. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's just... There's so much that we don't know. Cardiologists, about. right, right, and eighty different key genes that we were talking about with that. Absolutely, the, the defects from a copper deficient heart. Right. So it's just there's so much that we're piecing together. But at the end of the day, it's it's wonderful to know all this, the the the, the real subtle actions and reactions of copper. But at the end of the day, we need to figure out how do we get it back into someone's body. Right. And make sure that it's bioavailable. Right. That it can really begin to run the engine that, that's designed naturally to run our body. Also, too, following up on that. So you get the practitioners that graduated from the RCP. And now, and they're not only, you mentioned they're the practitioners like me, but they're also the want to knows like you and, and Martha that had a loved one that they right. want to be able to help and support. But at the same time, how do they make a... A uniform if I go to Istanbul or if I go to Moscow or if I go to Bangkok not that I would ever go to a, right. a McDonald's but I would go to the McDonald's and they would have the fries and they would be the exact same no matter what country I'm, I'm in H how do we get that for anyone that is is RCP aware that they can add their own flair to to how they practice and what their philosophy is and what they really excel in that's going to be completely no two snowflakes are the same right but yet they have a uh, a standardized objective consistent message that they have as their their foundational tenets that the RCP has created for them to be able to employ into their whether they decide to consult one on one or not, but they have that toolkit to be able to just turn key it, pardon me, to, to do how they want to do it. No, I think that that's a, a really critical step is how do we get this so that it, it can just really be this modular it's um I'm not sure what I don't know if I have an analogy, but it's like you you well, it's um it's like what we we can download programs 
right? And that this process, this, this protocol would download in the practice and it would completely change their activity. Right. I their mean, it, it, it does start with nowadays, I guess I did a lot of pr expensive testing, which I won't do anymore right. um, because all I need to start off, quite frankly, where I'm comfortable is if I have the full Monty, right. which is all of the, how is the cell, how are the cells respiring? Exactly. And how is the oxidate? Are they oxygenating or are they oxidizing? Right. Right. Uh, that's the term. And, and then from there, depending on my specific unique practice, I could do a, a DNA test. Right. Um, and, and I was going to mention that earlier when all of that negative regulation takes place and, and your body isn't able to make energy through recycling that ATP uh, or recycling that iron to make the red blood cells. That's where I see these genes get turned on so yeah. that they're not yeah. able to recycle effectively right. or they're not right. able to convert beta carotene into vitamin A effectively. Because why? I, I used the analogy this, this afternoon with my clients. Imagine me having a factory and we produce a certain widget that's very specialized, that is in, in demand, that a lot of countries want and we export it to, but no one's ordering them anymore. Right. So all of a sudden, I'm going to shut that wing <laughs> of the factory down right. and and keep what's keeping the bread and butter and the lights on in the factory and right. not invest man dollars. How that translates in our body is it, it genomically signals the turning on of genes that were meant to recycle effectively that are no longer recycling. Absolutely. I mean, you helped me understand that, Morley. That was like, why am I seeing all these things? But then it's because... The body is so intelligent, like we said, it stop asking, how can I overthrow the body and, and do what I want it to do and right. instead of understanding what the body wants me to do. Exactly. And it's really, it really revolves around, we live on a planet that has a lot of oxygen in the air. And we use that oxygen to make energy. But if the oxygen is not being used properly, if the oxygen is creating too much exhaust, that's when everything begins to respond to that. And it's all of the all of the hormones, the neurotransmitters, the neuropeptides are all oxygen sensors. What's going on with oxygen? And that I don't know that there's enough awareness about that, that if the oxygen is not being burned properly, being managed properly, being regulated properly, it's going to create all manner of, of dysfunction. Yeah. The body. Yeah. I mean, I think the Denon Harmon theory of, of free radicals, yeah. I, I, I think that it was very important to blow off exhaust so that you can temporarily shift the, the day jobs to the defense mode. Exactly. But then get out of that. Exactly. And the problem is we're never getting out of that. Yeah. Right? I, yeah. The, the, the sympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system is going to have a different response to oxidative stress than the parasympathetic. Just completely different responses. Right. right. And, so, and, and most people are stuck in sympathetic. They're just in constant fight or flight mode. And that has a, you, you can't metabolize your environment when you're in sympathetic overdrive. That, that's a basic neurological fact. And I think that needs to be understood. What is that doing, not just to energy production, but to the exhaust generation? Yeah, I, I don't remember who I heard say it, but there was a concern. I don't know if you agree with this. There was a concern back in the day that taking too many antioxidants doesn't allow. There are studies I'm sure that you've seen right. that too many antioxidants was actually life shortening. Yes. Versus, but right. I don't know if it's safe to say right. that now because we have so much more free radicals that are being being made or we have so much less bioavailable copper and so much more iron that so much more exhaust is coming that you're putting a chair off the titanic when you're doing an antioxidant approach well and so much of the of the focus in that research was around uh nutrient antioxidants they didn't get the enzyme antioxidants. right endogenous endogenous right. naturally occurring antioxidants right and people don't people don't realize that those studies were gained, and and I don't think they were truly uh, representative of the whole spectrum. Game of, study? Yeah, I know. Okay. I, mean, I know, but they weren't representative of the the full spectrum of antioxidant capacity right. that we have in our body. Right. Yeah. Right. 
So, so just in, in, in parting, one of the things I proposed to Morley, and, and we can kind of maybe put it out there and put him on the spot so that I have it on, on camera. Um, the name of the, of the lights that I have in the back is called The Truth About Your Health. And it's weird to have you sitting here because it's surreal. I don't know why I came up with it, but it just was one of those things where The Truth About Health resonated with me. And I think by elucidating the importance of turning over 2.5 billion red blood cell million red blood mm -hmm. cells per second right. and the importance of cellular respiration uh is really in line with the truth about your health and what it's, comes first it's foundational to me to me it's like if there needs to be uh, an ongoing dialogue it gets people oriented to what is re really happening um and the, um, the individual we're staying with uh, here in, in Florida, her name is uh, Heidi Pallion, and one of her good friends, um, his name is Anthony. And he came in with a t-shirt, a black t-shirt with white letters, and it was truth over everything. And, and that's, that's his uh, right, tagline. Right. And we had this fascinating conversation about that word about the truth, and don't confuse your facts with the truth. Right. Because what's happened now is people are getting misinformation. They think they, it's true. Right. It, it is factual. Right. But is it accurate? Right. And is it complete? And so what I think what Joel and I labor over is what, what do we understand? How do we convey that so that there is this uh, greater expression of, what is the truth of how we stay in balance and how do we stay healthy? And it's a, it's a, it's a full-time job. Yeah, missing truth, missing information. Right. Right, but, but my idea was there's, I think there's a, a movement now. Right. It, and you can kind of sense it where you said there's a lot of in this area, but you, you are getting Johnsons and the, the Perlmutters and the Gundries that are talking about mitochondrial health and longevity and health optimization. Right. What, what I like to see is when you read these books, why is there no mention of bioavailable copper and cellular respiration? They talk about mitochondria, they talk about the gut health, they right. talk about getting mitochondrial nutrients and support, but there is no spark plug to talk about how you activate hydrogen and oxygen into water and release ADP into ATP and clean exhaust. There's, there's nothing being ta told about that. So what I would like to do is potentially have a, a continuing dialogue with you mm -hmm. and, and talk about these new trends that are coming through and, and say, listen, everything about that is right, but here's some of the missing flaws or here's some of the things that makes their theory Incomplete. Incomplete and catalytic when these things are there. Right. It will, it will just enhance everything. Absolutely. I mean, and what, what I think is sparking Joel's comments are a lot of, lot of contemporary literature now uh, around uric acid. And we don't have time right now. To right, right, that right. That another program. Right. But you can't talk about uric acid and not talk about copper. It, it's impossible. Right. And you, you certainly can't talk about fructose, which becomes uric acid, if you don't talk about copper. Right. And so th that was, uh, as soon as I started reading these books, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they're, they're missing the whole point. And I think what Joel's picking up is a need to ground people's understanding so that they have a, a better filter to know what is the truth. Right. You know, and not get fooled by the, by the latest, greatest thinking. Well. Are they are they addressing certain key questions, right? As it relates to what we do know about copper's role in the body, right? No, that's fantastic. Well, I have so many other things that are going on in my head, but I think that's a good time to stop. I think I, I respect your your time. You and Doctor Liz got to get some food in you, right? Yeah, and that's right. Um, get on with your day. So I enjoyed that. Um, we'll keep it ready for part six next time. Can't wait. This is great. <laughs>